Good morning. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today to celebrate International Day of Rural Women, which is this Sunday, 15th of October. I'm absolutely thrilled for us to come together to celebrate such a special day. My name is Melissa Hepworth and I'm NAB's Executive for Business Execution in our regional and agribusiness. And I'm really grateful that I've spent most of my professional life living and working in regional Australia and raising my family as an executive at NAB. I'm super excited to be joining you today from the beautiful and actually very warm Toowoomba. And I'd like to acknowledge the Guyabal and Jarawa people who are traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today and pay our respects to their elders past and present. At NAB, we are really proud to be part of our communities across regional and rural Australia. And I'm so pleased that so many of our colleagues from around the country can join us on the call today. I'd also like to extend a really special welcome to our customers who have joined us. I'm so glad you could make the time to spend with us this morning. And I know your bankers will be too. Today, I'm also joined by these two lovely ladies, our inspiring guest speakers, Amanda Tolson and Wendy Ferguson. I'm gonna introduce you to both these ladies in just a second. For the past 15 years, the United Nations has led the celebration of the International Day of Rural Women to recognise the enormous contribution that rural women provide to their communities. Women have long been the backbone in regional communities. I've spent a lot of time with our colleagues and customers right across rural and regional Australia. And I know that a lot of the decision-making on the land and in our businesses in regional locations is driven by women. Not only do women make up a huge proportion of the agricultural and regional workforce, we make significant contributions to production, food security, nutrition, land and natural resource management, building climate resilience and holding communities together. In our developing countries, women make up almost half the workforce in the agricultural industries, but continue to face challenges in things like accessing land, education, and access to credit to finance their business goals. On days like today, it's important to take a little moment to look back and actually appreciate just how far we've come. Sitting here today, it's hard to believe but before the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974 was passed, women in Australia were not allowed to open a bank account or get a credit card without the permission of their husband or a male relative. Women weren't allowed to sit in the jury box until it was made legal in 1968. And women who became pregnant usually lost their jobs until the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which was passed in 1978, was approved. Now, sitting here in 2023, it is crazy to think that we lived in a world where that was true, and we've come a long way since then, but there's absolutely still work to be done. At NAB, we are really committed to achieving gender balance equality in the workplace, and we're really proud that this year we now have a 50-50 gender balance in our board of directors at the highest level of our company. And we're also really proud of the fabulous and inspiring women we have in leadership roles right across our organisation. Actually, including Julie Rinsky, who was our fabulous host of last year's webinar celebrating International Day of Rural Women. And Julie was actually recently awarded the 2023 Women in Finance Banking Award um, for her prior role in leading our regional and agribusiness, which was fantastic. We are really privileged at NAB to be part of communities right across regional Australia in all states and territories. And our amazing customers share with us insights not only into their businesses, but also into their families, their goals and dreams, and also how they're thinking and feeling about the current economic and social environment. Our recent NAB wellbeing and consumer behaviour surveys revealed that women are more stressed about finances than men. And while men are reporting better emotional and mental health, health than women. 
We did some research recently. Our household financial stress index revealed a couple of really interesting things, which I just wanted to share with you this morning. So women continue to report much higher levels of financial stress than men, particularly around accessing funds in an emergency situation. Men across all age groups that we surveyed reported having more savings. For our women, the stress around having debt was much higher and women generally had more outstanding debt for all types of loans other than that which was borrowing from family and friends. We also did some surveys around consumer stress which showed Men across the country in all age groups are reporting better health outcomes than women, especially around emotional and mental health. And we're going to talk about that one a little bit more later on because this week we also celebrated World Mental Health Day. Men reported having higher levels of stress over jobs and government policy, but women continue to worry much more about the cost of living and funding their retirement. And with cost of living pressures growing, more consumers are cutting back on spending on a range of items. We noted the higher number of women cut spending across most areas, but particularly in ones which I found super interesting, which were things like micro treats, which is, you know, treating ourselves to something special. Food delivery services, entertainment, and eating out at restaurants. So all those little things that, you know, give you a bit of pep in your step, what our research is telling us is that women are cutting back on those little little treats more than men. Now, being the banker in my family, I'm the one who takes care of most of the financial admin. Same as I'm going to do all the taxes and I'm pretty sure my husband's not going to ask me to build anything. I don't think it would be structurally sound. But this is on top for me of being a mum, working full-time, and also doing some volunteering in our community. And my brain often feels like your laptop looks when you've got 10,000 internet browsers open. You're managing all of those tabs all at once. What our research highlights is I think many women are feeling the same way. We're feeling the responsibility for managing all of those open tab sheets for their families. It really highlights how important it is for us as women to be connected to our communities and to have really great support networks and trusted people around us, including from a financial perspective, so that we've got help around when we need it and to put plans in place. Now, today we are unbelievably fortunate to be joined by these two amazing women next to me who are going to share their experiences and insights with me on how women are facing into society today, and I'd like to introduce them to you. With us today, we have Amanda Tolson. Amanda is the director and heads up her firm's commercial and property section for Clifford Goldson Lawyers. Amanda is a highly experienced lawyer and provides expertise across all areas of rural, commercial, industrial and retail property and business transactions. She advises on key legal issues in business structures including partnerships, companies and trusts. Amanda's also heavily involved in her local community with various board, volunteering and committee roles. I'm guessing that your brain looks a bit like a lot of tab sheets open as well. It absolutely (laughs) does. does. I'm also thrilled to be joined by Wendy Ferguson. Hi, Wendy. Hi. Wendy's the principal of Glen Oaks Santa Gertruda Stud. Born and raised at... How do you say that? Wallenbilla. Wallenbilla. <laughs> on her parents, uh, Santa Gertruda Stud, Wendy gained hands-on experience working in the cattle yards, as well as general properties on the general property duties, office work, data entry, and then went on to complete diplomas in marketing and advertising, office management, frontline management. Wendy and her husband Scott operated the Glen Oaks Fitting Service for nearly 35 years alongside their own farming enterprise. And if that wasn't enough, in 2010, they purchased a news agency here in Toowoomba and added four properties to their portfolio. Wendy also is very active in the community and sits on the board of the Motel Investment Syndicate. I think there's a lot of open tab sheets across this panel today, ladies. Lots going on. 
But thanks everyone again for joining us today. And just to let you know that we will have some time for questions later on in the session. So um, you can do that by actually pressing on the question or the chat button at the bottom, Q&A button at the bottom of your webinar screen. And our fabulous team will collate those questions that we can share with the ladies later on in the session today. But we might get started with a few questions. Might start with you, Amanda. Thank you for joining us. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your business and um, what specifically you do there? Um, well, as you said, Mel, I'm a lawyer, so nobody hold that against me. Um, I'm, I'm the first lawyer in my family. I come from a long line of, um, of farmers um, and people from rural and regional areas. Um, and I'm one of four owners of, um, yeah, of Clifford Goulton Lawyers. So we've got a head office here in Toowoomba um, and also offices in Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast. Um, but as you mentioned, I, I specialise in property and commercial law, um, which, you know, once I would have thought was really boring, but um, it's it's really like banking in terms of I feel I, I get to be really involved in people's business decisions and, um, you know, help them along the way. So it's really enjoyable. I mean, I lead a specialist team of, of seven, but we've got about 40 um, in the team. So I became an owner of the business in the same year I had my first child, which um, drew lots of interesting commentary from people at the time. <laughs> um, and you surprised it how open people are in sharing their opinions. Um, but that was about 10 years ago now, um, and I've got three children, so it's been a pretty hectic decade. Pretty yeah. hectic, absolutely. Sounds like it. Um, that's a lot to take on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, Wendy, how about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so we have we live out at Nobby now. We have a Santa Catrice Stud, which my husband and I run, um, and then we created... We had a, well, we, with the fitting service, we had a lot of clients that were selling bulls all over the country and they were limited with where they could sell their cattle. So as a, um, as a development, we ended up creating our own sale on property as well. So we still, and we hold that every year, um, selling our own cattle plus some of our clients' cattle. So we have that as um, um, an annual event. Then... Um, we had kids and decided that we had too many droughts and we we're wondering how we were going to afford to um, educate these kids with a really, you know, in town here. And as they got older, we just looked for business opportunities for enough farm income just to try and give the farming enterprise an opportunity to take the pressure financially off the farming enterprise. So hence yeah. the news agency, which now is really um, evolving into a, a not necessarily a news agency anymore, gift store. And then we've just opened a second store fashion boutique here in town as well. And um, so that's what we've done in the last 20 years. And, and that's given us lots of opportunities with um, ex expanding our, far excuse me, our farming enterprise because we've taken all of that financial burden out of the farming cash flow. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to expand our property portfolio by, you know, better stud bulls, which increase the quality of our cattle, which, you know, we've been managing to do some pretty impressive record sales with um, over the last few years. So that's really exciting to see that, it, you know, it's a slow process, but it is a process that if you determine and you've got your goals, then you can actually achieve them. Yeah, fantastic. That's amazing. Um, I want to delve into a couple of questions around your experience as women in business in regional areas and particularly around when you started in the business were there any challenges that you came up with what interesting perceptions were you facing into um and how have you forged your path um i think probably like everybody who's listening when I started thinking about this, I had lots of examples, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think sharing them is really important because it makes you feel like it's not just you and, it, you know, it's not something that I guess you're not um, swimming upstream on your own. But um, and, and the one that I thought I'd share, I, I attended university in Brisbane, which was a long way from my schooling background. Um, I was educated entirely in rural regional areas in Emerald, Brookstead, which mm. is a tiny, it was a tiny school of 40 kids, and Pittsworth. Um, so I landed at the University of Queensland with, um, you know, 15,000 students and it was a whole new world. Um, but then I guess in terms, I really enjoyed it and then I went to join the workforce. Um, and I, I think I was always going to be instinctually drawn to somewhere that valued my background. Um, but, you know, I applied for an internship at the end of my studies with um, a big international law firm and, you know, that's when you're um, a successful university student, that's sort of the pinnacle. And I sat there um, 
in this in, in this interview and they noted my background and I'm ready to launch in passionately about why it's equipped me to be really practical and I can relate to people from all walks of life but um they pointed out that they acted for lots of banks and I was the daughter of a farmer and would I be able to um act for their clients in foreclosing on farmers if that was necessary and I was really quite offended, to be honest. Wow. Um, I noted I'm, I'm the daughter of generations of farmers. Um, I understand better than anybody else mm. um, the, the business risks. And as an almost lawyer, I also understand how the world and mortgages work. Mm. Um, you know, but for me, I think even that single question, it probably gave me an insight into the culture of a business that I couldn't see myself working for. And I think on reflection, you know, I was quite young. I was only 22 at the time. Um, but I, I'm really appreciative that I think I had enough insight into what I wanted for my future to go you know what they gave me an offer um, which again my some of my university colleagues thought I was mad when I gave it up but I just said I, I don't care who they are if that doesn't fit mm -hmm. and I, I'm feeling Agreed. essentially that at the start you've got to listen to those little voices um, and I ended up getting um, offered a similar role from another large very successful law firm but they actually had a really strong rural background and the feeling when I sat and talked to them was completely different they were actively looking and understood I guess what I felt like I was bringing to the table. And um, I had a really wonderful experience there, but came to a point where I went, you know what, I actually want to work back where my roots are um, yeah. and decided to leave Brisbane and, and try um, try to continue my legal career in Toowoomba. Again, um, being at a big firm and I was, you know, enjoying it and doing well, people said, you're mad, you're giving it all up, you're giving up this big future. Um, but again, back your instinct and um, it was the best decision I ever made. You know, I just don't think um, I would have had the opportunities that I've had, um, I guess, if I didn't listen to that to that little voice, which is different for everybody. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's fantastic. What about you, Wendy? Yeah, so growing up, I had I was really lucky. I had a great dad who we all got to do. We were all expected to contribute to the family business. So there was no just because you're a female, you don't get to do that. You everything is on the table for everybody. So I had that great experience. But then I left school and went home and worked and did a gap year and worked at home. And then the, you just sort of start. You know, we were showing cattle, and my family were really successful. And all of a sudden, you just saw a really different side of people that weren't really nice mm -hmm. and um and being a female because back then in the showing and in the stud industry females there were very few females around it was very male dominated and um and although I, I have lots of great friends from that that time it, it made me sit back and really assess how you have to handle people um in situations mm -hmm. and and there were days where I would be so sad because I thought I just can't believe how people are behaving and the things that they're saying and and so I feel like <clears throat> back then it was so character building and you actually had to sit down and really have a think about how you want to handle this and so probably where I found my strength was it's like just don't react but perform don't give them a reason to give you any um, excuse as to why you should be thought of less than them yeah and I just have always, and, and that comes back from having a family background where you were valued equally. So for people who didn't value me equally, um, I just wouldn't take it on board. But that, that you know, there's a time you have to, that, that's a development thing. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Both of those stories resonate so strongly with me. I grew up as the eldest of three daughters. So, um, you know, when in my childhood, even though it wasn't on a farm, um, and my dad's an accountant. Um, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like we grew up just believing that girls could do anything. And actually I remember the first time when I was really, that was really challenged. And I think it was my first portfolio management role at NAB. And I was super excited. I'd been an associate supporting bankers and was really excited to take on my first portfolio of customers. And um, we have surveys where customers can tell us you know how they're feeling and in one of those surveys I had one of my male clients actually write that they thought it was irresponsible of NAV to give a young woman the job that I had mm, okay. and I thought wow I'd grown up in an environment where you know women were really supported I joined NAV as a grad and had always felt really supported from a professional mm standpoint and then I had a customer who I was trying to help actually think 
that just because I was a girl, that it was actually irresponsible of a corporation to let me do that job. And I thought, okay, how do I handle that? And I actually sat down and went through all of the, I oh, will just give them to a bloke because, you know, this is too hard and I've got better things to do and there's people who value me over here and I'm going to go and spend my time with them. But I actually went out and spoke to that customer and sat down and said, look, here's all the things that I've done and I'm only interested in one thing and I'm only interested in helping you grow your business. And you can either let me help you or you you don't, but, you know, that's up to you. And how did he respond to that? He was a bit shocked, actually, first up. But, um, yeah, we ended up having a good working relationship together and he actually owned some management letting rights type things and we went on to do a, a, quite a few deals together. And in the end, he sort of said, you know, thanks for being a fantastic banker. But, you know, he was really challenging up front. And what that situation taught me early on was that, there are some values that I hold that I'm not prepared to compromise on and that's one of them. And I think that's helped me shape the rest of my professional career. That for me was the moment where it became less about what is the job and more about does the job align with my values and how do I think that I can add value. But, yeah, that was 20 years ago, mm-hmm. so a bit further advanced than that. some of those terrible laws, but, you know, not that far in the past. Um, and ironically, you by challenging him because he's obviously had a history where he's been able to probably bulldoze women being in oh, that, yeah. being that, you know, this is 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So you challenging him actually made him sit back and go, oh, hold on a second, mm-hmm. um, now I'll notice how am I going to handle this myself? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so all of a sudden he's made a choice that he's going to work with you and then you've got the, and look what you did for his business after that. Yeah, yeah. I'm right. proud of that. Yeah, you should be. It's yeah. amazing. Um, let's get back to talking a little bit about the research because um, I found that super interesting. Mm. We've got a fabulous economics team mm. and I love the stuff that they're doing. I mean, I'm, you know, my degree's in economics and I'm a banker, so clearly I love numbers. It's <laughs> Um but I really love the consumer behaviour type um, research we're doing at the moment. And what we heard before around the research was that it tells us that women are holding a lot of the burden around feeling the stress of the current cost of living challenges and, um, you know, holding that level of financial stress in their families compared to men and actually it feels like women are taking on a lot more of that responsibility than ever before, which in some ways I think is a great thing. Mm. But in other ways it's manifesting in, you know, stress. increased levels of, you know, stress mm. and um, at the moment. What would be your advice for women to make sure that they're getting the right, if they're feeling that way, to make sure that they're getting the right support and advice to help them deal with those challenges? I found all of that really interesting. I'm a, I'm a passionate feminist. I grew up with three brothers. Yep. Um, so I sort of sharpened that part of my personality quite early. Um, and I do a lot of reading in this space. And it didn't surprise me because, you know, when they um, women often take time out of the workforce, that leads to the lower super, all of that. But ultimately I think it leads to a lot of less financial control. Um, and so I always tell people, whether you're working or not, you need to maintain that financial control and feel like you've got the right to. Um, and I guess what, what really shows up for me personally, I've got a stay-at-home husband and he hasn't worked for 10 years now. Um, and when you put it, the shoe on the other foot, things like that seem really silly. Yeah. So, you know, in, in that similar, similar situation, if he thought he didn't have the right to contribute to how we spend our money or bank accounts, people would think that's madness because he's a man wearing that hat, mm-hmm. whereas I see a lot of women still say, well, I haven't worked for, for two years, so I don't. And, you know, the treats thing you were talking about, well, I shouldn't spend that mm-hmm. because I'm yeah. not working at the moment. And, and again, you, and so my husband and I have this really good trick where we just always reverse it and it happened, it's happening in our life and he uses it as a tool when he's talking to people as well when they make comments. Gee, you're doing really well with what you're doing with the kids. And he says, well, why don't you tell this other lady that? She does that just yeah. because I, you know, it, it's, it's a different view. So I think women just have to maintain control and have that confidence that they've got the right to be involved because we always say in my family it's a team and there's yeah. someone that's working and there's someone that's doing this and doing all of these things and we pick up the jobs and where the money comes in for whichever of those things we're picking up is just not relevant. 
we're a team achieving those goals and we've got the right to equal input. So I think making sure you don't step back is what I would really say. And I think when you're taking on things in terms of investment or making decisions around money, making sure you are getting really good professional advice. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm a professional services advisor, so I'm a little bit biased, but I do see sometimes people at the front end think, oh, well, I'll just save this little bit of money and it'll all be okay. Um, and some of the more difficult parts of my job is sometimes when I give advice and people realise something's a bad idea mm-hmm. and that feels negative for me and it feels negative for them. But ultimately when we then say thank you, actually, if I hadn't have sought that advice, you know, I can see now where that might have ended up. So I, I think just making sure we all, re- you know, everybody thinks, okay, who can help me and who's the right person that's really got expertise here if I'm making a financial decision, you know, if, to make sure it's going to be a good one. Yeah. yeah. And I think just actually not being afraid to ask for that help mm-hmm. is really important. Mm-hmm. Like we don't have to suffer through that alone. And I, I think that's one of the beautiful things about living in regional Australia yeah. because you're not going to find anybody in regional Australia if you put your hand up for help is going to say, no, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It is, there are so many resources out there and services that you can tap into, particularly if you're considering starting a new business or extending your business venture. It is, and and you're right about saving that little bit of money because, you know, that might cost you $5,000 to get that advice. That will save you a whole lot of heartbreak and a whole lot of money later on yes. in, in, in mistakes. And I, um, we've got three daughters, so we just keep saying to our children that are all now adults and have been to uni and, and we're just going, well, wherever you go, you need to be financially independent and you have to have control over finances in your relationships going forward. But it is a team. Mm. But, you know, just because you're having, you know, you're not working um in you, if you're having children and things, you still have to, there's more time for you to be um, invested in managing that. And I feel like, it, you know, I hear it quite often around friends that just don't, they don't even know how, how much money they've got in their bank account. They don't know if their like life insurance is paid. Like they don't, like that's to me irresponsible. Like you need to be completely invested in, in your finances. Mm. You have no one else to blame but yourself if you're not actually um have tapped into all of that and I do think that women are feeling the stress more because men are working on a sort of a compartmentalized um, part of their lifestyle whereas women are doing the children the living expenses they're doing the mum they're doing the wife they're doing work and they've got a probably an o- better overall um, idea of what money is moving around in their finances whereas men are like I go to work come home and I'm not men bashing, by the way. It's just, you know, that's stereotypical. Um, that, that's just how it is. And because women are really efficient, so if they're going to take control of everything, well, why won't you let them? Mm. You, know, you know what I mean? Like I yeah. just look at my family and I was like, yeah, Wendy does that. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Yeah. Well, you know, but, but there's always a team. It's a team thing, but someone's got to lead it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've had the conversation with a couple of, um, a couple of men that I've worked with and sort of said to them, you know, all that stuff that your wife does when you go home. Like, I'm doing all the stuff that you're doing at work and, and then I'm going and doing mm-hmm. all of that at home. Mm-hmm. And I think we've actually come a long way, and your example is fabulous, mm-hmm. Amanda, around challenging who needs to do what role in the family unit. Mm-hmm. Which is not easy when you're from a traditional background, though. Well, that's right. Mean, my, my, my grandparents just did yeah. not think that a man was probably capable of doing it. Yeah. Honestly. And it's it's not being offensive to him. They just literally had not seen it. That was, you know, something else. Like, they hadn't seen it done, so people don't think it can no. happen. Well, it's so. conditioning. We were conditioned mm-hmm. to yep. think that if that was our roles. Mm-hmm. So we've broke, broken um, that that long-term conditioning. We are the first generation of females that have worked full-time in our adult life and had children and continued to work, mm. which is why, you know, we're we're the new generation of um, women going forward. Mm, absolutely. I've got two boys and um, they're 16 and 12. I'm slightly terrified about the 16-year-old oh, learning to drive. drive. <laughs> <laughs> That's my biggest concern. His confidence isn't quite matching his capabilities right yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> um but I'm really conscious of, like, I want them to be proud of me mm-hmm. and I want them to see that, you know, that's the expectation that they would take into their future relationships. 
mm. that, mm. you know, it's an equal partnership and that, you know, the mum, the wife, the girlfriend, your partner mm. is absolutely out there kicking their own professional goals and making a valued contribution to their communities mm. and that actually that's their going in expectation mm. because they don't know anything else. And so, you know, that's the one thing that I, I hope that I can instill in my boys is that respect and kind of the, that generation will go in thinking that's completely normal. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah, really important. Um, both my boys are much better at technology than me. <laughs> yeah. Which, which brings us to our next question, <laughs> which is, you know, what an amazing technology medium where we're working with today to be able to have a conversation with people right across the country. Mm. Digital innovation and technology has so changed the way we work and live, particularly in regional Australia, right, because we are more connected than we have ever been able to be. Um, how has innovation and technology shaped your experience as a business leader? There's lots I could say about this one. <laughs> Um, I mean, at the moment in, in legal services, AI is a really scary thing because mm. they're telling us, you know, these, these robots are going to be able to spit out legal advice and we won't be needed anymore. Yeah. And, of course, any time there's new things like that, the forefront's always really scary. But I guess in our business in more recent times, it's been very positive. So remember that, that little thing called COVID, um, when that happened, we were probably, um, especially for a business of our size and our location, pretty early adopters of some key technology that got us through there. We had teams, which meant... People instantly, mm. the day that we had to close in our physical office and everyone worked from home was seamless for us. And some people were starting from scratch. Yeah. And we also were um, early adopters of um, the electronic settlements platform, which is called PEXA, which, again, okay. is a brave new world. Instead of meeting yeah. to do settlements with checks and paper, yeah. it happens in online. Um, and so, again, some, some legal firms were using that for the first time when COVID hit. So, you know, that really showed me, yeah, you've got to get on board early. You can't be scared of it because there's as much opportunity. There's, there's threats and opportunities and everything. So that was really... Um, and, then, and then after COVID, I think we're travelling less because, again, like today... You know, once I'm unsure five or ten years ago, speakers are flown somewhere to be in a particular location, you know, to give a physical speech in a conference or whatever. Mm. There's so much meetings, people are more comfortable having them via this technology and I guess have more, um, I think that's really rapidly evolved because people see that it worked, whereas I think it was a really slow uptake before. Um, court appearances are still happening. Not that I'm not aware that goes to court, thank goodness, but court appearances now can, ha are happening more remotely. So, again, Brisbane was the centre of the legal world and our lawyers yeah. just have to drive down there. So that, um, that helps so many things in terms of efficiency, work-life balance, all of those sorts of things. But, you know, I, I just think about study. I moved to Brisbane because I could not study um, law with the university I want to remotely. So I, yeah. I had to move there. Um, and now we can have people study their degree of choice while living and still contributing to their community, um, which I just, you know, think is fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, even in my, in my um, volunteer roles, I guess, um, I'm on the board of the Empire Theatre. We're recruiting for some directors now. Now, that's a really, we're in a regional community offering high-end, um, you know, a high-end arts business. But now we can, you know, we can consider bringing some people on the board that don't live in our local community for really specialist input, which is great for our local community. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, without technology, that's just not possible. It's not possible, yeah. Yeah, yeah amazing. How about you, Andy? Yeah, um, technology's been amazing. COVID was a really interesting pivot on that because in the rural sector, we've been working with online auctions like coinciding with our on-site auction. We were always putting it on live as well and it was just never getting the traction that yeah. we really... You know, it cost money and we were just, it wasn't paying for itself. The COVID happened, people like were restricted from interstate and all of a sudden now it's like a, we have, if, you know, and the thing is we, again, used to travel to bull sales and now you can go and inspect those bulls six weeks beforehand, go, oh, yeah, don't mind those. You can sit at home the day of the auction and you can do it online. You don't have mm -hmm. to buzz off and do that again. So you are, you know, time, it's better for your time management and, and efficiency. But, you know, we've seen a massive traction with that after COVID because people had to, they were just forced, as you mm. said, changing mm. the way they, you know, did business, yep. um, which has been great. But I just think technology, now that, you know, we've got better internet service out west in rural areas, it's allowing women 
in rural areas to do things like they can be 500 k's west of Longreach and they can be doing data entry for like a accounting firm in Brisbane or yep. Toowoomba mm -hmm. and that allows them gives them a one back to the financial independence it takes the pressure off the farm you know with yep. you know living expenses and gives them a purpose because I feel like the, the um, having that that little bit of time where you get some self satisfaction out of something you've achieved that isn't that normal yes. everyday stuff gives you a lot of self confidence mm -hmm. and a sense of achievement in a day. Yeah. But that's like it's just making the world so much smaller, mm -hmm. um, you know, and online businesses and things like that, and accessing resources again and information. It's just it's limitless. Mm -hmm. But you're right, you know, it, there is that balance. But you know, I just feel like it's all there if you need, if you want it and want to use it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, COVID was a game changer. Yeah, I think totally. Yeah, I mean, we're a Melbourne centric organization, and I really feel for my Victorian colleagues who tell me mm. how horrific yeah. it was during that period. But you know, I like to look on the bright side of life, and I think there's been you know, some things that we had to adopt during that period to survive that actually post that is helping us thrive. Mm. And the technology is one of those. I mean, I'm super lucky um, in that, you know, NAB's a really flexible employer. And so living on the Sunshine Coast, I had been sort of remote work enabled for a number of years before COVID because I was supporting national teams mm. from the Sunshine Coast. And... Um, we went from having, I think, about 5,000 of our colleagues enabled to do that to everybody, mm. like, in a week. Mm. Amazing. Because, it's like, you know, we had like to 10 years, 10 years yeah. or 20 years of growth, wasn't it, that just then was forced upon everybody. I think that is one of the yeah, really bright sides of everything that happened. Oh, I totally agree with you. And it just became the way we do business now. And I think we're taking... We're, now that we've sort of come out of the, the COVID period, we're taking the best parts mm. of what we learned mm. and reshaping what the mm. future looks like. And I think that's yeah. that's an exciting thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And also you know, just with document signing, for example, yeah. how much easier is that? Yeah. Oh. You can just flick it off, it's done, it comes yeah. back, yeah. and then you just pop the original in the mail later on. All of that generally, you can just... It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I did actually have to have a laugh this um, last couple of weeks. As I said, my 16-year-old just got his learners. And um, to get his learners permit here in Queensland, he actually had to have a, an ID document with a signature on it. Mm. And I thought it was hilarious because how I got him a document with a signature on it was um, we opened a bank account for him online. And got a card for him online he, with online documents, which I had the physical copies of when I yep. went to Queensland Transport. Yeah. Um, popped his signature on that card, and then they would give him the license. <laughs> and I thought, I'm so glad that I'm working in an industry where yeah. you know we're embracing the new technologies to make life easier mm. for customers. Mm. And you know, you can see the day where I, I remember when I was a banker signing documents, and I'm guessing you could do Amanda like when you sit there and you do your signature like a hundred times mm -hmm. a day, and now you're like, you don't sign things very much anymore because yeah, right. we've we've moved beyond that and evolved in. Mm -hmm. I think the technology is making you know professional life so yeah. much easier. Yeah. And what I love about that is it actually means that you get to spend less time doing all that admin yeah. stuff and you get to spend more time Important stuff. just mm. connecting with people and building yeah. relationships and, you know, spending time on things that add value to people yeah. rather than the administration, which is fantastic. Um, all right, I'm going to open up for some questions now. So we've been having a good old chat here, um, but I'm interested to hear from those of you listening if you have any questions for our panel. And I know that we've got a couple that has come through um, already. And if you would like to ask a question um, of any of us, then you can do that by um, just pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of your webinar screen. Um, one of the questions that we've had come through so far is, Ladies, what would be your tips for women starting out in business or wanting to take that next step to a leadership role? Well, I think you have to do your research. Yeah. I think it's really important you understand the business you're going into. 
and getting legal advice and financial advice from very reliable sources, not your girlfriends over wine at five o'clock on a Friday <laughs> afternoon. Like you need to be focused, you need to think and definitely consider all outcomes and scenarios and that's the worst and the best outcomes you can get. And with anything, because without having the worst and the best, anything else is unrealistic. You need to have in your mind, if this all goes pear-shaped, what is the worst case scenario financially? How am I going to get out of this? Yeah. And what if, if and well, obviously you're going into it with the idea that it's going to be um, very successful, but then, you know, as you grow, you need to be mindful that to keep growing that success, you need to have constantly good advice along the way to make sure you're setting up your financial um, entity, you know, your entities, particularly going forward with long-term, how are you going to get um, selling at the end end game, whether you're going to sell it, whether, you know, investment-wise, how is that going to affect your super funds, tax, all of that. So I'm a big believer in but you just need to think about the big picture, but you need to have your research. Like can you possibly, is this business as successful as you think it's going to be? Because there's a lot of blips along the way that you don't ever expect to see and you just need to be mindful that they're going to be there and they're going to come out of left field and you need to have a backup plan for those. And that would be clearly having that financial buffer would be the key. But advice is key as well. Absolutely. And I guess with that advice, my view, though, is take the risk. I Mm -hmm. think um, our economy, and again, this is speaking generally, but our economy favours risk takers and men are usually naturally more likely to take risk. Um, I know, and I, I'm just really grateful that I came from a background of entrepreneurs, really. I grew up watching um, my family pivot as they have to in, in business. And, okay, we haven't grown that before, but we're going to give it a shot because, you know, the prices are good this year. Um, so, you know, when I'm there and I'm pregnant and I'm proposing to buy into a law firm, everybody told me, wait until you finish having your family, oh, you know, those sorts oh, of things. Yeah. And, again, without that, that confidence, confidence in myself, but also... You know, the first thing my dad said to me, he knows nothing about law firms. He looks at the numbers, though, and he goes, if you don't invest, I will. And he says, and get in now. The earlier you're in, the earlier you're out without debt. And so, again, I think as women, you've got that little voice telling you to be very cautious. And, again, you've got to have the advice. You've got to make sure it's the right decision. But don't be so cautious to think that this this is perfect time because it doesn't exist. Um, you know, and at that time I was thinking, oh, what am I doing? I'm taking everything on at once. But I guess at the age that I'm at now, I'm really quite young mm-hmm. to be in the position that I'm, yeah, that right. I'm at. So I think, yeah, t- it's got to be the right risk and it's got to be with the right advice. But having that appetite for risk, that's what's really, that's what gets you places in the way that it's, you know, our economy set up. Mm-hmm. So true. Mm-hmm. The, the, when we opened that second store just recently, I mean, it goes against everything in the economic climate at the moment, but the opportunity was there. And it goes down to that, also that gut feeling, which I know bankers don't like. <laughs> I'm going to say, I had that conversation with mine. Yeah. Um, I said, you know, I just know that and it is an opportunity and you do have to take the risk. Yeah. And that's my point with look at the worst case scenario. Like we always went, if the worst case scenario is that you get out of it for what you put into it and you yeah. get experience and and. Um, life experience along the way, well, then you've learnt something anyway. Yep. But you wait, there's no point sitting at home going, oh, I wish we had something more without having a crack at it. You've got to really put yourself out there. Mm. Um, and that takes courage. Absolutely. And then you need to be, you know, again, that's the team, it's having, supporting and getting a great network of people around you that are going to back you and they will help you succeed. Mm. And that's 100%. really important. 100%. I think some of the best advice I ever got was, um, when you're presented with an opportunity, say yes and work out if you can make it work rather than go, oh, I can't do that Mm. and then come up with the reasons why not. If you start with the the viewpoint of actually, yeah, why not? Mm. And um, I've been lucky enough. I mean, NAB's a fantastic organisation, huge breadth of opportunity across, you know, a multitude of different fields and that actually has served me really well when you get the tap on the shoulder and someone says, have you considered doing this? And I know that a lot of women would look at, you know, a a job spec and go, well, I can only do nine of those ten things, so I won't put my name forward. Mm. Um, A man would ask for the job before they were offered it when they could only do two and back themselves to do the rest of them. 
Like we just have to change the way we think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was the one thing that I anchored back to was actually if your first reaction is, yeah, and how do I make this work, yeah. rather than, oh, no, I can't do that because of, you know, X, Y, and Z, and you just sort of reframe the conversation mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, and that one's worked for me and given me some mm-hmm. different pathways that I probably wouldn't have otherwise considered. Yeah. Yeah, which has been fantastic. Um, Great question that's come through from um, one of our audience members today. Do you think we have a more equal playing field today ready for the next generation of young rural women? I'm trying to be measured in my thoughts. (laughs) I I think we've come a long way and we still have, but we still have a really long way to go. I think there's some some things you look at and, and, and yeah, again, when you look at, the, the things you said at the start, you know, 50 years ago you had to quit your job yeah. when, you know, when you feel pregnant. Um, but I, I just am I'm a big believer we shouldn't rest on our laurels and you hear small things every day that and I say lawyers are trained pessimists. We always look for the problem. But they disappoint me where I go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe things like that are still being said or still happening. But that's why I think it's incumbent, like you're talking about how you raise your sons. No one should rest on our laurels. It's all of our jobs to be out there. And that's I, I, I really don't like people who say I'm not a feminist. I think everybody should be because being a feminist is just about equality. Mm. So every person should say it's still we're still on that journey. And in every small opportunity, wherever it is, it's an opportunity to push that. And so I've turned my husband into a feminist in those opportunities at school where sort of, you know, slightly sexist things get said. You know, people just don't think about it. But instead of just letting it wash over, again, it's not about being confrontational, but it's just about yeah, noting it. Oh, you might not have realised, but that made me feel like you're saying whatever it is. So mm-hmm. I just think everybody feeling that um, we're all still part of a journey um, and that it's not about... Yeah, women doing everything. I think that's probably the the thing that I've realised that, oh, now we can work. So we have to do everything that women used to do as well as work full time and don't make it look hard or it looks like you're ungrateful for the way that things have changed. I really, mm-hmm. that really irks me. So I think it's also about empowering empowering men and changing the way that their world works as well because there's this concept that we can't achieve what we can do what we want unless men have flexibility too so um certainly in our business you know what we look at well it's not actually in a family situation it's not about women being given flexibility when they have small children it's about you know men who are fathers they have to have the same thing Mm -hmm. for it to sort of flow through the family so yeah yeah absolutely well it's so true Mm -hmm. i mean when we bought the shop in town i had two girls in town and one um still out at home so scott had to do the pigtails and do the kid, you know, the lily drop off and went and had coffee with mums and, you know, went and helped with tuck shop and things. And um, he's a great father of daughters and empowers them. But it really surprises me. I do feel like, you know, women in the rural areas, though, if they want to have a rural enterprise, happened recently to um, a family member, and she was running the family property and her father died and then she was just trying to, you know, evolve into how she was going to manage that. It was it was really interesting because she was on her own with my auntie, the comments that were made and the doubt people were putting in her mind about whether she was um, capable of doing it, even though she was doing it as a partnership with the family Before, anyway. anyway. Yeah. So, you know, that was really difficult for her. And it surprised me that she was feeling and experiencing that. And I, that disappoints me because everybody in rural areas know that women are equally as capable and, you know, they work. It's, I mean, I just get all struck with what some of my friends do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they just as equally work as hard side by side with their husbands and what they do is amazing. But they're then all over the finances and the business mm-hmm. and growing the business and, so, um, yeah, it, it's just really interesting mm. how that, I would love to say, yes, it's evolved a lot and it has, but I don't, I feel like there's just there's just um, interesting comments that you come out and think, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's actually a great question that's come through that builds on that, which is what do you think is then the most impactful step that businesses can take? to create capacity for both women and men to play a more supportive role in the family to create those equal opportunities going forward? Well, I think it's 
treating men and women the same. Yeah. As you said before, it's a family environment. They're teens now. They're not, you know, one's mm. less or more than the other. So I feel like as a business or, I mean, certainly as me as an employer with my staff, it's like your family comes first. So let's tell me what you need and see if we can work around that because that's what I need from my business for me. Mm. Um, so I would I would say that it's pretty that it's just that simple. It's not um, just because women get maternity leave because they're giving birth. It doesn't mean that well men are now getting maternity leave. But just because she's having the baby doesn't mean mm. she doesn't get the promotion. Mm. Yeah, that's a thing that I think in the yep. legal world might be still a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just heard this the other day. And, and, and I mean, and, and that's when when I was having my first child. And I'll, I'll be back after three months. Um, oh, but you know. You probably won't. Well, well, why? Just because you haven't seen it. If, if that's if that's my plan, that's what's going to happen. Mm. So mm. I think it's everybody having that open mind um, about about those things. And again, people may want what they want, and that's good. Everyone's path is different. But I think those yeah that that flexibility in in thinking about um, policies like parental leave, not maternity leave, mm. because again, and, and I, I mean I think. The government's got to lead a lot of this, and they are in terms of rebranding what some of their policies and big, big organisations like MAB have been doing it for a long time as well. In terms of it doesn't matter who takes the lead, but it's the small things as well. It's the, the male employee feeling like they have the ability to say, "Can I come in late that day because I'm going to, you know, the, the sports practice or whatever?" And I think um, so. This is the Annabelle Crab, the wife drought. Mm-hmm. And this is the it, it, the biggest thing you can do for women is to have a supportive partner. That's actually the That's key to key. success. Yeah. Whereas I think again, the problem of um, women's development and our place in society is usually put back with just it's a woman problem and it's not at all. Mm-hmm. Which, you know that that policy they had a long time ago of women being paid the equivalent of their wage while they're on maternity leave was just seen as the golden thing. And well, that doesn't help because still when they go back to work. If their husband cannot or partner cannot take time off to help with the family, that's yeah. dealing with you know a six month or twelve month period in isolation. So, um, yeah, I think it's that seeing the family unit and as in, in whatever role you've got, you know, seeing if you can affect change by the way that you um, it helps you become an employer of choice as well. I mean, oh, if you know that's you're offering those sort of things to your employees. It's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I remember when I came back from um, parental leave when I had Coops, my oldest. And, um, and, and getting a lot of questions around, oh, you're coming back full time. And I was like, well, firstly, I know myself and um, I would end up working full time. So I might as well get paid for working full time because <laughs> if I said I was going to work four days a week, I can guarantee you I'd be working on the fifth day. Yeah. So I want to be financially yeah. compensated for the value I'm giving. And secondly, um, like it's really important for me to feel like I'm giving a valuable contribution to society, to my community. I'm a better mum to my boys yeah. because I have this for me. Because you have self, um, because you have a sense of self with the achieve, yeah. you feel like you've achieved something and it's not all, of, um, and it, it does feel like it's not thankless in regards mm. to the, like I know we love our families and we're contributing and we're the mums and the driving force, but it's also that going out and getting, um, you're filling your cup and giving yourself a sense of purpose and a sense of self. So therefore you are a better mum when you come back in because you've also you you've you know you feel like you've achieved something in the day and you're connected with people that you're like-minded with and, and that again just fills your cup. Yeah. And when you feel when you're feeling good about yourself, you're a better person all round. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And no one questions, yeah, a, a man's ability to be a great dad when he works full time. So yeah. and I just sort of throw those things in. It can seem really aggressive when you actually say it to people who say those things. But you just say, well, you know, this person's just come back and they've got young children, but nobody questions why why they're working full time. So I, again, I just really like to flip it around, and I think that's a really useful way because people again, a lot of it. Is well meaning. People don't mean to be offensive. But well, it's just that it's a long mm. history of conditioning, yeah, which we're slowly chipping away yeah. at. Yeah. But you know, my grandmother and great grandmother were the greatest mush owners. So I bet you know, because <laughs> the men were like, you know, you oh the poor you know we'd bring all the husbands home. Oh, the poor 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 Scott, poor Charlie. You know, it's always about the men. You need to yeah, look after the men. Yeah. And so I just wish to look at that going, that's not, I, I can't get that's how they were brought up. And I'm looking going, that's not going to work for me. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we'd have great conversations about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
challenging the norms. Mm, mm. I love it. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left. This is actually fine. I love spending mm. some time with you ladies. A um, couple of quick questions maybe to finish off. Um, it's been World Mental Health Day this week. What's the one thing you do to maintain good mental health given the multitude of open tabs in your brains at any one point in time? I think it's giving yourself time. And, again, I think this 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 mum guilt is, is, again, more strongly present in women. But, you know, you've got the right to find something that you like, allocate some time and not feel guilty about that time. Um, so, you know, day-to-day, week-to-week for me, that's, yeah, exercising, making sure, and, and sleep. Sleep's so important and it shouldn't be the thing that goes. But um, I guess in the last five years I've started scuba diving which I was terrified of and then I went hang on I'm getting to that age where new things are scary I'll push through it (laughs) yeah you do Um, really enjoy it and I like you know I was saying it's really nice because it's so quiet no one can ring me and nobody can even talk to me um, although my, my, one of my colleagues I scuba dive with, she tries and it's quite amusing to watch somebody. <laughs> she's literally trying to talk underwater with a mouthpiece in. It's hilarious. Um, so I think, yeah, trying those new things and things that give you that outlet. And, again, when I'm down there, I just get to concentrate on myself. I don't have to think about my job, yeah, my kids, whatever I'm doing, it's, it's something for yourself. So whatever that is, it looks different for everybody, but trying to find something. Yeah, yeah. that's great. What about you, Wendy? Oh, I love um, doing yoga. I think that's the one time that, you know, I have no phone for the hour, no one can get hold of me, and it's like a very quiet, it's a bit like scuba diving, that you know what. Um, but I think it's also, I'm a big, you know, like, oh, I've got so much work to do, I need to get this done, and then friends are going, why don't you come into town, we're going to have lunch, and I'm like, oh, I've just got too much work to do, I just can't. And instead of, it will still be there tomorrow. Yeah. So it's almost just saying, just go and have a couple of hours. Because yeah. mm-hmm. spending that time with those people that, you know, feel... Um, fill you with full of joy and you have a great laugh, it actually just recharges your whole energy battery anyway. Mm. So it is that life balance, which I'm not great at, mm. um, I'll have to admit. Mm. I Some days I'm going through a stage at the moment where I'm looking at it going, we need to have a correction. I've yeah. taken too much on and I need to sort of work out how I'm going to remanage that. But I'm aware of it now. Mm. So 20 years ago I was just going to be the martyr. Mm. Yeah. I was going to drive myself into the ground yeah. and it was going to be, it, it, was, it ended in tears. Yeah. So yeah. now I can see I'm very in touch with how I'm feeling mentally, physically, emotionally, and I'm going to talk about it with my husband. I'm going to tell my kids how I'm feeling too mm-hmm. so they know that this is actually normal. Yeah. And I, am you know, go to a bit of yoga, I love my gardening, and I just go, right, oh, this is yeah, time to go outside, time to shake the dogs for a walk, time to just mm-hmm. take that day off from work when I'm rostering all, you know, things around and just go, this is half a day that I'm just going to go home now and just this is going to be for me. And then I can recharge and I can go again. But And then I don't want to end up where the things go pear-shaped again because, you know, it takes a long time to come back from that. It does. Mm. It does. The elastic band. Mm. And it snaps. Well, to join that back together is hard work. It's hard work. It is. I totally agree. I think the things that, finding the things that fill your cup, for me, it's sunshine. You know, thank God I live on the sunshine coast. I get a fair bit of it. Um, but even just, you know, five, ten minutes in between meetings, just go and sit out in the sun, listen to the birds, have a moment of peace and quiet, mm. sort of immerse yourself in that and think, you know, that's enough to recharge me, go again. The other thing for me, I'm a hugger. I love hugs. <laughs> and, um, like, thankfully, my 12-year-old, my 12-year-old is um, five foot ten. Now, oh, my, my, my husband's six foot four. I mean, I'm really tall boys. But he just gives the best hugs. Mm. And when I'm travelling for work, I find that's the thing I really miss mm. is, hey, like a good hug, you know, yeah. you just feel connected. You're like, yep, yeah, this is good and I can go again. Mm. Just got two minutes left. So to finish us off, what would be the one piece of advice that you would give to young rural women? Um, resilience. Resilience? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, you know, to be honest, life is great, but life is not easy because you have to have the bad or the or the challenges, though, not bad, bad's terrible word. Yeah. You have to have challenges in your life so you feel like you've achieved. And also you, without those challenges, you don't appreciate what you can achieve and how successful you can be. And with you always have to pay the pie up. So mm-hmm. what come, it, it's all about resilience, determination and having faith in yourself. And just going with you, going with your gut, but you have to believe in yourself. And it's very hard for a younger person to do that. And I can say that now at 50, because it's taken me 30 years to work that out. But it is a thing 
that you must, um, I really would love younger people just to, they believe in themselves so much more than we did back then, but um, they also aren't being challenged to be resilient and it, things that, things don't always go your way and that's the reason, that's where you actually have the choice of how much do you want it. Mm. Yeah. And you pick yourself up and you go for it. Mm. It's awesome. Love it. Love like it. That pressure makes diamonds. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. And totally. so and so you're going to get something really good out of that difficult time instead of seeking out the easy or what feels easy. Um, but I love that. Julia Gillard used to say all the time, you can't be what you can't see. And, yeah. you know, that concept of can I do this, I haven't seen it before. That just means you're the trailblazer. Mm. So, yeah. you know, back yourself. Yeah, just... Just having that faith in yourself, surround yourself with people who back yeah, you as well. Absolutely. If there's someone telling you that that you can't, they shouldn't be on, a friend of mine talks about their dream team, they're not on your dream team. Yeah. So yeah. make sure you've got the right people around you. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have people that challenge you. So everyone doesn't have to be a yes person yeah, in your group. It's not Instagram. No. no <laughs> but, you, know, have, you, you, you don't have to have a big circle, but particularly those people that you're going to talk about those opportunities with, make sure they're people that get you. And they might challenge you, but they're the ones that are going to give you that faith. When you come with something, can I do this? They'll tell you, yes, you know, you can and give you that little bit of confidence that you need to maybe be the one that, you know, forges the path for somebody else. Yeah. So. I've had some amazing friends that have just gone, mm. I just, oh, you know, what you're doing is amazing. How did you even get to where, you know, making, deciding you're going from cattle to retail? Mm. And I said, oh, I just, just had to have a crack at it. And it is all about that. Mm. And it is that tribe. Dream team, yep. really yeah. important. Yeah. People that want to pull you down, that's because you're challenging them. Yeah. yeah. And and what they're not doing in their life. Yeah. So you need to understand, people need to understand that it's not about you, it's about yeah. them. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Well, ladies, that hour has absolutely flown thank by. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've loved spending some time with both of you. Um, and thank you to all of us, all of you who joined us on the call today. Um, I hope you do something fabulous to celebrate the amazing women in your lives on Sunday for International Day of Rural Women. And um, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks, Amanda. And thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.